this has not been a normal time in the life of the church, in the life of America, or in the life of the world. And there are so many things coming at us every single day. It seems like something else, and then something else, and then another thing. And I, I, there are morn, mornings that I get up for my quiet time that I am literally sitting there without a word to say. It's like, God, what, what am I supposed to say here? How am I supposed to address all of the things taking place in our world today? In my own little mind, in my heart, what am I supposed to do? And I find myself more and more going back to this passage for comfort, for direction, for what to say and how to say it. And I hope maybe you this morning will find that as well, that as we reunite, reconnect with this most powerful prayer, that you will feel some of those things, things that I have felt, the calm, the direction, the understanding that God knows all, that I don't have to have the answers, that I don't have the answers, but I know who does. So if you would join me this morning as we reconnect with the Lord's Prayer. You have in your handout, if you, if, if you picked one up, beginning in Matthew 6, verse 5 through 15, I'm just going to read it. Read along with me as I read. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners and to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. But do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men they, uh, when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Simple, direct, not many verses. Something you have probably memorized in your life. If you have not, I hope you do. We call it the model prayer. It is a prayer for us. It, you know, sometimes prayers in the Bible, we think if we pray them, magic happens. That's not what prayer is about. You know, it's not an incantation. It's not something we can pray one, two, three, and then all of a sudden we get a result. This is a model prayer for us to use in our moments when words won't suffice. Our own words, we don't have them. That's what has become so powerful for me. Because I can sit, I can look at our world, and I can say, Oh, God, if only... But the direction comes for me from these few words here today in the model prayer or the Lord's prayer. As it begins, we're, we're going to meet, mainly stick with uh, verses 9 through 13. And it begins with, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. For me, this is a directional, positional statement. I, I, I don't know about you, your family, but in my family, I, I had a fairly decent dad. He, he was deeply flawed like most of us fathers. He did okay, but there were times when if I followed him as what I thought a father should be, I would be absolutely mistaken and out of line. But the fact is, this prayer begins with, Our Father in heaven. And we are to understand from this that we have a father. We have a father that is perfect. We have a father that created us in his image, the Bible says. He created not only us, but everything there is. So when we start from a positional standpoint that our Father in heaven, 
our Father, we can understand that that is a loving Creator. Somebody who created you with a purpose and a reason and a plan. Somebody who loves you with the perfect love that you may possibly have never experienced from your earthly father. But the fact is, he is our father, and he loves us. Not only is he our father, he is holy. I, I, there, are, there are times when I read scripture, and I, and I would love to be able to go back and just get a snapshot of what takes place back in the Bible times. Uh, but one of those times would have been Moses. Uh, when he was in the desert and the bush was burning and, and he goes over and he, he hears God talking out of a bush uh, and, and God says, hey, Moses, you're on holy ground, my friend. I can't imagine what Moses' response would have been or what my spot response would have been. But the fact is, we have a holy God. Now, what does that mean, holy? Uh, you know, a lot of teens today have holy genes. I've got some holy pants. That doesn't make me holy. What is holy? Are there places and times in your life where you have felt the holiness of God? Uh, maybe it's a special place in your house where you, you, you pray, where you go into an inner sanctum, your inner room, and, and there's the holiness of God in His presence. I, I don't know. I, I do know that there is something special about God, and He is holy. He deserves our worship and praise, as Dave so aptly said this morning. <laughs> there is a difference between just singing and praising a holy God. He is holy, worthy of complete devotion, <clears throat> as, one in, uh, as one perfect in goodness and righteousness, sacred and revered. He is powerful. There was a time when I was on a golf course down in Florida, several years back, uh, actually many years back, it was when uh, George Bush was president. I don't, I, I don't recall why I knew what, what was taking place was taking place, but I, I saw people going to a, the fence by this road. And I, I was like, ah, I better go look. There's something coming down the road. So I go over to the fence. <clears throat> I'm watching. And all of a sudden, there's a caravan of buses and cars coming down the road. And it was George Bush campaigning. Now, I can't for the life of me tell you why I experienced what I experienced at that particular moment in time, but I began to shake a little bit. How silly is that? Not because it was George Bush, because it was, it was the President of the United States. There was something powerful about that moment. Now, I... I I'm not, you know, I'm a patriotic guy, but you know, I wouldn't consider myself, you know, you know a crazy patriot. But something happened to me in that moment. I was playing golf. I didn't care who was coming by the road. But when the president of the United States came by, I shook a little bit. Folks, we serve a God who puts the president of the United States to shame when it comes to the holiness that he has and the power that he has and how we should recognize that. Our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. Holy is your name. It's a positional statement. And it gets us in the right frame of mind when we talk about praying. If this is a model prayer, that's our first position our first ideal uh, of, of how to pray is to put ourselves in the position of knowing that God, the Creator, is here in our presence, listening to me, and He is holy. And I come before Him. Verse 10, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, those of you who have kids, you know the statement as you're traveling. What do you hear? Are we there yet? Right? Uh, I say it for fun all the time as we're on trips, uh, even though we don't go with little kids anymore. It bugs my wife. Are we there yet? 
I, I, when I think of the kingdom of God, I think that's probably a statement that is probably not unfair. Are we there yet? Are we at the kingdom of God? Where is this kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of God? Jesus spoke a whole lot about the kingdom of God. Matter of fact, if, if you read your Bible, there's a lot of that red letter stuff that talks about the kingdom of God. John the Baptist talked about the kingdom of God. It was near. It's coming. <clears throat> it is something other than what is, what you know. Some of the scripture that talks about it says uh, what it's like is in Matthew 13, just over a few uh, pages. It, it talks about a mustard seed, the fact that the kingdom of God is, is, it begins small, but it grows large. The kingdom of God is like yeast that you put in some dough. It starts out just a small bit, and it infects or goes into all of the dough. It also talks about the kingdom of God being like a hidden treasure, that it's something to be sought after and valued. Uh, It goes on to talk about it being like the priceless pearl. That great little parable where it said the, 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 uh, the pearl dealer went and found a priceless, sold all he had to get it. That's like the kingdom of God. Okay, so it's coming, it's near, it's valuable, it's something we want to be a part of. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. And then one of the most perplexing and I think clearest visions of what the kingdom of God is comes out of Luke 17, 21, where Jesus says, the kingdom is within you. The kingdom is amongst us. You see, I think we are guilty, just as the disciples were guilty, of thinking about this kingdom of God being in a building being a physical kingdom. Now, it may be at one point in the future when Christ comes back to establish His kingdom, but right now, what we're talking about when we talk about the kingdom of God is something that happens in us, something that happens in you. Your kingdom come. My prayer, Father, is that your kingdom come comes in me you see I think if we have the right thinking and understanding of what the kingdom of God means to me is that it changes me his kingdom lives inside of me it begins to change begins to change my mind and my heart to become more like who Christ your kingdom come Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God is working out His will and His plan. Now, if you've watched any news lately, you would ask yourself, is this it? Is this the will of God being worked out in the world today? Or if you're experiencing hardship in your life right now, is this the will of God? Could this be? Father, why? That's the question I ask often. Father, why? How could this be? But the model prayer tells us, encourages us, invites us into the understanding. His kingdom is being worked out by His will being worked out in His own time, in His own way. It is ours to take that truth, understand it, and be at peace with it. That's the hard part, to be at peace with it. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The will of God is real and being worked out and coming to pass here on earth just as God desires it to be. And the fact is, I want nothing more. I want nothing less. I want His will to be done in my life and in this world. It's a powerful thing to understand that the will of God does not mean my personal comfort. Now, that's an uncomfortable statement. 
Because when we pray, oh God, let your will be done, most of the time we're asking for personal stuff. Oh God, if it's your will, let me be healed. Oh God, if it's your will, please bring to salvation my friend or my husband or my wife or my children. Oh God, if it is your will, please let our world get better and let things become more at peace. Oh God, if it is your will, and on and on. And we are praying specifically when we ask that for things that we think are God's will. At least I do. I confess that. And when we read a statement like, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we should all be drawn back to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now what took place in the Garden of Gethsemane? That was where our Savior, Jesus Christ, over in Luke twenty-two forty-two, 42, bowed before His Father and said, Oh God, if you would, in, in common language, I think he was saying, oh, I don't want to do that, Father, what's about to happen. I really don't want that. And if you would, if you could, would you please not have that happen to me? And yet at the end of his prayer in the garden, we all know what he said. And if you don't, you need to hear it. He said, but... Not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. Oh God, if you would just understand that if only this would happen, it would be so much better. Life would be easier. People would be better off. If you would, if you could. Oh God, if you understood how badly I'm hurting right now in my heart, if you would just heal me. Father, if you would just heal my child, things would be so much better off. I cannot explain the working out of the will of God in life. And you can't either. But here's what I know to be true. His kingdom come is reality. His will be done is what we want only that's all we want is for his will to be done and to understand that my comfort has nothing to do with it oh that hurts well well well, hang on wait just a second you mean if if i if i don't like what's taking place in my life that's a good thing okay there are things that you and i both know we need to do better We could do better and things would be better. There are other things in our life where we can't fix it. No matter what we do. But we have to understand that even those things we can't fix, that God is at work working out His will, His way in His time. And it is up to you and I as believers to understand that truth and to be okay with it. The last part is where most of us struggle. And to be okay with it. To understand that God loves you so much. He's leading, guiding, directing, doing things in our life, in my life, in your life. That only he knows what's taking place. I can't imagine this morning. I don't know what time it is over in Afghanistan. But there are Christians in Afghanistan right now who are fearing for their life. That is, that's not an overstatement. They're fearing for their life because of what they believe. Imagine their prayers at this moment. Father, would you please grant me safety? Would you please just get us out of the country? Would you please, would you please, would you please... And at the end of the day, some of those people are going to lose their life. I say that only to say, is that God working out His plan? I have to think yes. But does that bring comfort to those people in their distress? 
I hope it does. Follow me here just for a second. The will of God being worked out in my life, I'll say it again, does not guarantee my comfort. And it does not guarantee your comfort. What it does is to give us strength in the process of life, no matter what's taking place. No matter if we got a bad report from the doctor, cancer. No matter if we have a, a, a hard marriage crisis taking place, possibly divorce. No matter if our children are, are going over the edge and struggling with all the stuff that's taking place in our culture today. God is at work. God is working out His plan. And we can take comfort in that. The uncomfortable part for us as humans, let's be honest, the uncomfortable part is the fact that we don't know, and that kind of upsets us sometimes. We don't understand it, we do it different, and we just don't get it. I can't imagine what the disciples felt as they stood before the cross that their Savior hung on. I don't get it. I don't understand it. How could this be? The will of God was being worked out in their very presence without them understanding. Our Father, who art in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I pray above all else that his will be done in my life and in his kingdom. Verse 11, give us today our daily bread. We like this one. Give us today our daily bread. Yeah, all that other stuff, that's kind of heavy. Yeah, we just want to eat. Give us today our daily bread. So deep, so life-altering if we get to the truth of what this really means. Give us today our daily bread. Uh, if you just step back up real quick to verse, uh, to verse 8 in this chapter, chapter 6, it says, Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. Comforting? Yes. Disturbing? Yes. <laughs> Why is that disturbing? Because we're Americans. Come on. And I spent time in Texas. Bigger is better. More is good. If a little is okay, then surely a whole lot is even better. God looks at us. He knows our needs. He sees each of you here this morning, whether online or in-house. And I promise you, from the Word of God itself, He knows your needs. Now, some of us are pretty educated people. I won't say us. I'll take myself out of that equation. Some of you are pretty educated people. And that statement makes no sense to a really educated person sometimes. God knows your needs, so don't worry about it. Whoa, 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 hang on. What do you mean, don't worry about it? Uh, don't you understand that uh, I have to worry about it because that's my job. I have to worry about it because I have a family to take care of. I have to worry because I have bills to pay. All of those things are true. And yet... God goes on to say, through Scripture, that we're not supposed to worry about it. Matter of fact, if you just turn the page over in uh, chapter, this still in chapter 6, verses 19 through 24, and, and then 25 through 34, it talks about what our treasure on earth is. <sighs> Guys, I understand treasure on earth. I get it. I'm an accountant. Uh, I've been in finance. I, I've done sales. I know what it means to sell $100,000 items. I get what that means. I know what treasure means. But I'm here to tell you this morning, we have got to separate earthly treasure from what God is talking about. From what Jesus is talking about right here. He's not talking about money. You and I equate blessing and prosperity with money. 
That's just the way it is. We're humans. We're Americans. Those two things go together. Blessing and prosperity means God is working in my life. Right? Yes. That is true. That's not where this is headed. Give us this day our daily bread. We have the truth that God knows. He provides. He knows everything I need. And I can take comfort in that. And then in verses 6, 25 through 34, if you go over there and read that, it says, I'm not supposed to worry about what I'm supposed to wear and eat and where I'm supposed to sleep. I'm not supposed to worry about it. What does that look like? (laughs) How does that feel? Let me tell you something. If I don't pay my bills or my wife doesn't pay our bills she does the finances in our house uh, that's the way we've learned how to live if she doesn't pay our bills I get to yell at her but what happens Uh, stuff starts getting turned off right water goes electricity goes cars begin to leave Uh, we don't have money for food things begin to fall apart That's reality. Give us this day our daily bread. But what if I began to look at each one of those things as God sees them? What if? Do I need X, Y, and Z? Do I need so much of this one thing? I imagine your closet looks like my closet. If I go in my closet, what do I find? Things I haven't worn in years. Shoes. Okay, my shoes are okay, but ladies, shoes. We began to equate things again with the blessing of God. Give us this day our daily bread, again, I think is a positional statement for us to understand that He knows our needs, and it's not always what we think we need. For the most part, it usually isn't. God provides. May may not always be what we want, how we want it, when we want it. The fact is, we don't have to worry about it. Now, there's not a thing in this passage that says you should feel guilty about having. That's not there. That's not what I'm headed for. Okay? That's not where I'm going. Where I'm going, though, is that what if all of it were taken away? What would happen to your faith in God? That's the question. If all of our stuff somehow was gone, where would my heart be in relationship to our Father who is in heaven? Holy is your name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. But I really don't like you taking away my stuff. Guys, I don't know if we will ever be in that place. I don't. I think the possibilities as we look across the world are that persecution is a very real thing. And persecution may itself come to your doorstep. How that looks, how that feels, I have no idea. But what I know is this has to be settled. That if in fact I wake up one day and I am without, does that negate the power and will of God? The answer, no, absolutely not. But hang on, I need my cars. Wait a second, I I like my house. I, I like my stuff. My stuff, as a matter of fact, defines me. Oh, hang on just a second, wait a minute. You just went over the top. My stuff defines me. Thank you, Lord. (laughs) For those of you online, if you didn't hear that, there was music playing. 
it was a good moment. And I've got to wrap this thing up. I'm telling you, I could go weeks on this. And I know you don't want me to. So I'm going to go really, really fast and just help you understand, get a grip on the fact that as we position ourselves before a God who loves us, understands us, He gave us the model prayer for us to pray, to be involved with Him in all that He does and, and all He wants to do in our lives. Real quickly, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, those who sin against us. Sin is the problem. It cannot be taken care of in any way, shape, form, or fashion by me or by you. God came through, the, through His Son, Jesus Christ, to give us an opportunity to be sinless, to have our sins forgiven. Now, the other side of that little equation is, as we forgive, as we forgive, as you sit here this morning, has somebody offended you? Are you at odds with somebody? Are you hanging on to that? Because you're right. And you may be right. That's the power of this little scripture. It doesn't matter if you're right. If you're holding a grudge. If you are bitter. If you are saying, I will not, cannot forgive. God says, we got a problem. We got a problem. We have an issue. For you see, the front side of forgiveness is God forgiving us. The back side of forgiveness is us forgiving other people. And the front side, while I don't think that goes away, I think the power of it is limited because of the way we forgive. If we don't. How many times, Mark? What did Peter say? Seventy times seven. Over and over and over and over. Forgive. Forgive. Don't hold the bitterness. Bitterness will rip your heart out. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not to temptation. Verse 13. God knows we're going to be tempted. All of us know that. If you're human and you have a heartbeat, you're going to be tempted. God knows that. And, and this prayer kind of, it handles that. God, lead us not into temptation. He knows our temptation is going to be there. But he also knows that he can take care of it. We also have to understand that it's not him who tempts. He doesn't bring the temptation into our lives. That's James 1, 3. But I will say that the battleground is in our, our hearts and in our minds. It's not out there, it's here. The battleground is in our hearts and our minds. Garbage in, garbage out, right? You've heard that before. What, you fertilize, what are you fertilizing with? Now, while manure makes a great fertilizer for your plants, not so good for you and I. What are you fertilizing with? What are you watching? What are you reading? What are you spending time on? We have a part to play in this temptation. Know that God cares that he allows us the power and strength to overcome. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We have a, an enemy who is after your heart. Don't ever forget that. I, think, I don't think you do, but don't ever forget that. You have an enemy who is after your heart. All of this stuff we've talked about this morning, Satan would love for that just to go away or just to be bent in such a way that it makes you doubt. 1 Peter 5.8 says what? says that Satan prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. I want to go read the rest of that passage too as we close. Over in uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all of your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the whole world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. 
And the God of all grace, who called you to the, His eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will Himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To Him be the power forever and ever. Amen. We all know that Satan is at his best when we are at our worst. We understand that he is trying to take our peace. Put us in a position where we doubt that God is at work. Where we doubt that his will is being worked out. God offers us deliverance. He does protect us and will protect us. But we must do our part and trust him to do his. We need to stay connected to God through the reading of his word, through the being with people who are like-minded. We need to believe that he's forgiven all of our past. I don't want to go by that too fast, even though we're out of time. He has forgiven all of our past. What is the first thing Satan uses against us most of the time? Our past. You can't, be, you can't be that good of a Christian. No, you look what you've done. Look where you've been. God has forgiven through Jesus Christ, sacrifice on the cross, through His overcoming death. He has given us forgiveness. Believe He's forgiven all of our past, is present with us now in this place, and is directing our steps into His future for us. So as you pray, and as we close, this is the model prayer. I know as you pray these few sentences, all this stuff won't come back. But I hope over these next days, weeks, years, you spend time with this prayer. See what God has to say to you through it. It's powerful. It's powerful. Where you are this morning in your spiritual life is important to God. As we close, I want you to know that if you have never given your life to Christ, if you've never started that relationship with Him, that can happen today. That is one of the miracles of God I will never understand, but I know it to be true. The transaction that takes place when one person says, I believe, Lord, forgive me of my sin, come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. It's a real transaction that takes place in the heavenlies. And works itself out here amongst us. If you are without Christ this morning, you've never said that prayer, you've never given your life to Him, you can do that today. Simply by saying, Father, come into my heart. Forgive me for my sin. I want to be your child. That begins the relationship. Connect with the church. Whether it's this one or another church, you connect with people who believe that same thing and grow in your faith. That's called discipleship. Maybe you're here this morning and you're experiencing a downtime, some weakness. We all go through those moments. That's a part of the human condition. I'm here to tell you this morning, nothing's changed about how God sees you. Nothing. When He sees you, He sees love. He sees his child. He sees his perfect creation. If you need to reconnect with him, that could happen today. Ask him to. Ask him to. If you would, stand with me. I want us to close and pray the Lord's Prayer together before we sing. I know some of you may know it with these and thys and thous. Feel free. If you have the, the notes this morning, you can see the verse in there, that I, the words that I'm going to be using. Let's say this together as His church, as His people. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who owe us stuff, who forgive, who, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And all together, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.